Hello everyone and welcome to our sixth annual Holiday Lantern Tours program. Although the program is going to have a lot of familiar features to each of you, uh, the way we're presenting it this year is very different and then we're presenting a virtual format. But before we get started, I just want to take a moment to wish each and every one of you a happy, safe, and health, healthy holiday season as we continue to weather the coronavirus pandemic. It's my hope that this program brings you a little bit of holiday cheer and what could prove to be a very difficult winter for all of us. The program you're about to see is going to be made up of six different scenes. Five scenes will take place on our historic buildings and a sixth scene being a holiday ghost story. The actors you're going to see in the program are not professional actors. There are wonderful volunteers here at the Historical Museum at Fort Missoula. They're all folks from our community that really care deeply about the stories that we have to tell here in the Missoula community. The theme for this year's Holiday Lantern Tours is going to be Holiday Lantern Tours Greatest Hits. So kind of like when your favorite music artist puts out a Greatest Hits album, that's what we're seeking to do with this year's program. All the scenes you're going to see are taken from one of our previous Lantern Tours programs in the past five years. And we've chosen them, some because they were fan favorites, but others because we felt they were especially timely as we move forward uh, into this holiday season. So one of the things we've tried to do with the program this year is we put a number of different safety precautions in. Uh, you'll notice that some scenes do have more than one actor. In that case, all those actors are from the same family unit or pod, so there's no risk of two people that are not in the same household infecting each other with the coronavirus. As we have for the past few years, we're going to begin the program with a ghost story from our very own Victor Mackert, one of our Friends of the Historical Museum board members. This is a tradition that's gone on for many years, as it started back in the mid-19th century with Charles Dickens and stories like A Christmas Carol and A Cricket on the Hearth. Finally, I just want to ask if you're able to please consider making a donation to the Friends of the Historical Museum so that we can continue to put on great living history programs like this as well as our education programs and help to preserve our building and grounds here at the fort. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Victor. Greetings all of you. We are in the midst of the winter holiday season. Halloween and Thanksgiving have come and gone. This is the time for Hanukkah, Christmas, Kwanzaa, and a new year, a better year, 2021. As you know, one of the great traditions of the winter holiday seasons is the ghost story. Almost everyone knows the story of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. Remember the three spirits. Each takes Ebenezer Scrooge into another time and another place. In each, he learns an invaluable lesson. So to get into the spirit of things, I'm going to tell you a kind of ghost story that I first heard as a boy back in the late 1940s. My father was a railroad agent. We lived in an apartment above the depot in a little town of about 60 souls far out on the eastern prairie. One bright moonlit night in December of 1948, my father woke to hear the sounds of doors opening and shutting in the offices downstairs. And then he heard footsteps making their way up to our apartment above. My father jumped out of bed, crossed the living room and kitchen, threw open the stairwell door. There on the landing below was a tall man dressed in the winter garb, garb last seen some 50 years ago. The man beckoned to my father. My father stood there. The man beckoned again. My father started down the stairs. The man turned and went down into the lobby. My father followed him. The man opened the outside door and stepped out. My father followed him out. It was icy cold. A bright full moon lit up the landscape. The depot platform was gone. The railroad tracks were gone. The grain elevator and the houses were gone. All my father could see was an endless ocean of snow and grass. And there, maybe a hundred yards off to the north, a small sod house with a light burning in the window. The man started for it. My father stood there, looking at that light. The man stopped and beckoned to him. My father stood there. He turned about for a moment. My mother was standing behind him. No, she said, no. My father turned, stepped, stepped back, and shut the door behind him. He 
woke up. He was back in bed. My mother was sitting up beside him. My mother said, I just had the oddest dream. I dreamed I followed you down the stairs and there's a strange man on the landing below. And he kept on beckoning you to follow him. And you did. And I followed you. You opened the back door. And the town was gone. All I could see was a field of snow and a distant hut with a light in the window. And that man kept on beckoning you. Thank God you didn't follow him. As for my father, over the years he wondered, what would he have seen if he had followed the man to that hut? The original non-commissioned officers' quarters is one of only three buildings remaining at Fort Missoula from the first era of the fort. Fort Missoula had been founded by Captain Charles Ron and two companies of the 7th Infantry in the summer of 1877. The 7th suffered greatly at the Battle of Big Hole against the Nez Perce Indians in August. Depleted in strength, the 7th was replaced by the 3rd Infantry on November 14, 1877. The 3rd Infantry constructed the majority of Fort Missoula and stayed until 1888 when they were replaced by the 25th Infantry. When we enter the NCO quarters, we will meet Lieutenant Colonel John R. Brooke and his eldest daughter Louise, who is visiting from back east. He is the commander of the 3rd Infantry at the fort, and it's Christmas Eve, 1878. Oh, well, well, oh, oh my, dude, oh, please, come in, come in. Uh, I, I am delighted to have this opportunity to uh, take a break from entering in my daily log. Uh, oh, Louise? Yes, Father? Uh, Louise, we seem to have some Christmas visitors. Oh, how delightful. I was just finishing up some crafts. Please make yourselves comfortable. Oh, yes, yes, uh, 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 please. Oh, but, mm, you know, I don't think we have too much time. Yes, unfortunately, we'll have to be off shortly to get things ready for the big celebration tomorrow. Our mother will be furious. Yes, she will. And, and I'm also, I, I'm, I'm sorry that we don't have anything in the way of refreshments to offer this evening. However, if you stop by tomorrow, uh, you could sample some of our famous artillery punch. Oh, Father, not artillery punch, but a noxious brew. Nonsense! No. Artillery punch has many wholesome ingredients. Well, it may start out that way with green tea, brown sugar, cherries, oranges, and lemons, but then... Oh, but then, then comes the good stuff. There's wine, rum, whiskey, brandy, and gin. Now, legend has it that it was invented by a very clever bartender as a way to drive up the bill for some intoxicated soldiers. Uh, now, I can personally attest to the fact that it will warm you up, and it does provide quite the punch. Now, Father, Christmas is not all about drinking. I have some wonderful memories growing up at various posts of celebrations. Well, very true, very true. Uh, but any type of celebration depends upon a, a number of different factors, including the attitude of the commander and the uh, status of hostilities at the time. Now, I can distinctly recall several Christmases spent out on the frontier uh, when dinner was simply a, a piece of salt pork, hardtack, and a cup of strong, sweet coffee. Oh, if you remember, oh, oh now, where, where was that? Was that, uh, Fort? Uh, uh, doesn't matter. But there was a, 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 a very strong Indian threat at the time. Yes. And still, we managed to decorate, well, a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, sing, and celebrate trying to make the day as joyful as possible for the post children. Yes, that was absolutely terrifying. But at an established camp like Fort Missoula, oh. there's very little activity now. It can get quite dull and routine, what with all the drills and fatigues you have them into, and just the daily routine of keeping up house. Well, that is true, and yet, as far as possible, on Christmas, I like to give the men a day off for relaxation and recreation. Well, I've even been known to release the prisoners from the guardhouse for the day, uh, depending, of course, upon the nature of their infraction. Yes, everyone gets so excited for weeks in advance. Oh, 
Well, yes, today, everyone at the fort is frantically getting ready for tomorrow's celebration. Uh, officers, our wives, children, the soldiers, even the camp followers. Yes, if you were to visit the mess hall right now, you'd see Mother directing them in various tasks. Hanging paper chains made by the children, um, nuts covered in cigar foil, old Christmas cards cut up and tied with ribbon, and of course lots of colored candles. Oh, it's going to be beautiful. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, tomorrow itself, on Christmas Day, mm -hmm. we'll start early with uh, singing and a service in the chapel, uh, but then later comes the big Christmas dinner. I mean, our cooks prepare a veritable feast. Now, I think you can probably understand that during most of the year, uh, the troops receive pretty plain provisions. Uh, truthfully, sometimes barely edible. But on Christmas, the cooks do everything up properly. Well, I understand that tomorrow we are going to have four different types of meat. There's going to be uh, elk, venison, turkey, and ham. And of course, we all delve into our secret stashes of treats and liquor to add to the festivities. And then, then come the desserts. Mm, well, you can see the father is quite the fan of desserts. But he is correct. You cannot even imagine all the wonderful things there will be to eat. There will be pies, cakes, apple duff, canned peaches, and of course, my favorite, fruitcake. Well, I, who does not love fruitcake? Yeah. Oh, father, tell them about the time you really got into trouble with mother. <laughs> oh. This was Mary's first Christmas on the frontier. Now, she had spent two entire days preparing four delicious fruitcakes, only to discover that uh, when she returned from choir practice after on Christmas Eve, I and three of my brother officers had eaten them all. Well, she did not leave a note, uh, but I immediately told her that the cakes had been very well received and my friends remarked that they were perfectly delicious. However, she, she, she was still not at all pleased and, oh, hmm, we dare not show any signs of intestinal distress later or I would still be hearing about it. Well, you can be certain that mother certainly remembers it. <laughs> But Christmas is, after all, for the children. And growing up on the frontier, I can attest to that. As you know, military life can be strictly regimented and based on rank, with wives and children basically assuming the rank of their father. However, Christmas is the one time of year where we are all equal. Everyone shares the same meals and receives the same gifts. Well, yes, and uh, tomorrow Santa Claus is arriving with those gifts immediately after our church service. Now, unfortunately, Santa's reindeer were unable to make it this year. Uh, now, we have been experimenting with army mules. Uh, it's not going particularly well, but we are persevering. Yes, and when Santa arrives, he's bringing an orange, a box of candy, and a nice present for all the children. A doll for the girls, a wooden animal for the boys. And then following that excitement, we all get together and sing. Oh, if we were only at the regimental headquarters at Fort oh. Shaw, we'd enjoy a marvelous concert by the regimental band. Oh, it, it would be wonderful. Uh, and, and then after, we would uh, all just prepare, clean the mess hall, and get things all ready for the pageant mm -hmm. and the costume ball. Yes, and some of our more musically inclined officers and soldiers create an orchestra of accordions, harmonicas, banjos, juice harps, and we dance all masks. We dance the quadrilles, waltzes, polkas, and the latest dances from the East. I virtually remember dancing with every man on the post until I got married and moved away. But then at midnight, we unmask and we bid everyone the best of the season. Ah, uh, yes, it's a wonderful time, but my personal favorite part of the entire day uh, is the Christmas pageant. Mm -hmm. Now, last year, Mary organized the entire thing. 
Uh, she started with a series of tableaux to entertain the children before they went to bed. And then we had all types of different acts. Oh, there, there was that juggler, uh, pantomime, dramatic acts, comedy, mm -hmm. and singing. Oh, oh, I remember. Mary suffered a sudden case of stage fright just before her scheduled duet. Now, fortunately, Sergeant Mann bravely carried forth alone and sang those exquisite aria from Il Travatore. I, I was ready to promote him on the spot. Yes, and Mother even convinced you to join in on the fun this year. I am to be Balthasar, one of the three magi, you know. We three kings of Orient are bearing gifts we traverse. Yes, Father, that will indeed prove to be quite interesting, slightly amusing. But I do believe we've taken out too much of these nice people's time already. And we must be off to dress rehearsal, or Mother will have a fit. Oh, my goodness, you are correct, Louise. I'm sorry, uh, but uh, perhaps another time. Uh, we want to thank you all for stopping by. And we'd like to wish you all a happy, happy Christmas. Christmas. Our next scene will be the museum's homestead cabin, where we'll meet a young couple. A year has passed for Emma and Ralph Sharp. This will be their second Christmas in Montana. After the stock market crash in 1929, this young couple lost everything. With no jobs in Chicago, they have come here to Montana in hopes of starting anew. They have worked hard the past year and have continued to grow their small Christmas tree farm. Ralph also has hopes of branching out and adding some livestock to the farm in the coming year. Despite their hard work, things are still difficult for the Sharps as the nation remains in the depths of the Depression. When we enter the homestead cabin, the year will be 1931. Well, good evening, folks, and Merry Christmas. Say, some of you look a bit familiar. Have we met before? I think we may have met, but I can't remember where. Well, come on in and warm up for a moment. My name is Emma Sharp. My husband Ralph is out back chopping firewood, but he should be in in just a moment. Pleased to meet you, Mrs. Sharp. We are just getting ready to celebrate our Christmas Eve dinner. Unfortunately, Ralph wasn't able to get an elk this year. However, lucky for us, my garden did very well, and Ralph was able to use some of our Christmas tree sale proceeds to buy a couple of pigs and cows. You see, Ralph and I are homesteaders. We moved here a year and a half ago from Chicago. That's where we met and married. But things became very difficult after we, we wed. Ralph's family, family lost everything in the Depression. With the little bit of money we had left, we packed up and moved here. Life is so much different here, but we've tried our best to make it home, and soon we'll get to start our family here. Emma, who are you talking to? Oh, howdy folks. Are you lost? Did your wagon get stuck? No, Ralph. They're just visitors warming up for a moment. But perhaps they could stay a little longer. It is so nice to have visitors this time of year. Well, I think that'd be just fine. What was it you were saying about starting a family when I came in? Oh, nothing. Hey, maybe they can help us decorate our Christmas tree. Would you be willing to help? I think I'd be happy to help, Mrs. Sharp. Great. You know, we moved out here to start a Christmas tree farm. That industry's grown rapidly over the last decade. Back when I was a kid in Chicago, almost no one had a Christmas tree. But now you can go to almost any house in the country and you're likely to find one. And Montana's the perfect place for growing these trees because of the timber industry here. You see, once most logging companies finish clearing the land of the usable trees, they tend to burn that land to get rid of the scrap. Once they burn that land, that creates the perfect environment for the whole forest of Douglas fir trees to grow. And these trees develop different in Montana than elsewhere because of the short growing season and the dry climate here. This allows the trees to grow real dense foliage, making them the perfect Christmas tree. They say that in the, in the next couple of years, over one million Christmas trees will be shipped all over the United States from right here in Montana. Business has been growing rapidly, and I've heard that number could double over just the next couple of years. 
I was so worried when we moved here, but we have grown to truly love it here, and I'm so excited for the life the three of us will soon have. Three of us? <sighs> say, I could go for a Christmas carol right about now. Did you say three of us? Here, here's the words. Join in if you'd like. Deck, Deck the halls with boughs of holly, fall la 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 Tis the season to be jolly, fall la 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 Down in our gay apparel, fall la 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 Troll the ancient yuletide carol, fall la 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 See the blazing you'll be for us, fa la 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 Strike the harp and join the chorus, fa la 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 Follow me in merry measure, fa la 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 While I tell of yuletide treasure, fa la 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 Thank you both for your hospitality. Well, thank you for bringing a little Christmas cheer to our home this Christmas. Merry Christmas. Ralph, I think there's something we need to talk about. As we approach our next building, we will step back in time more than 100 years. It's 1918 and World War I is winding down in Europe. American GIs are starting to return home, and while one tragic event is coming to a close, another one is just beginning. The Spanish flu is raging. It has closed the schools, inundated hospitals, and even resulted in restrictions on public gathering. St. Michael's Church is the oldest building in Missoula County. It was constructed in 1863 and moved many times across Missoula. When we enter it, it will be 1918, and St. Michael's Church is downtown in Missoula on the Catholic block. During its time downtown, the building was used for a boys' home, um, extra buildings for the hospital, and as storage. Well, good evening, folks. I wasn't expecting any company. Were you looking for the patients? Uh, they were here, but about a week ago, the flu started to calm down. They moved them back here from the uh, church into the main building. Oh, actually, we were out and about and just looking for a place to get out of the cold for a few minutes. Well, I welcome the company. Uh, pardon me, I don't think I've introduced myself. I'm John Jones, and I'm a handyman here at St. Patrick's Hospital. My boss calls me a jack of all trades. I was just cleaning the church here, and as I mentioned, there were patients here just a week ago. Has the Spanish flu hit Missoula hard? Well, although there are exceptions, I believe it has hit pretty much every place in the country hard. Every day in the Missoula, there are lists of uh, people who the flu has carried off. And this is despite all the city has done to try to combat this particular scourge. We're from out of towns, Mr. Jones. Can you tell us about how the Spanish flu has been handled in Missoula? Sure. One of the first things done was to limit or even outlaw public gatherings. For the first two weeks of December in Missoula, all public gatherings were declared illegal, and this even included church services. However, I hear that ban will be lifted by December 23rd, just in time for Christmas Mass. What about other activities? The University of Montana has been closed until the first of the year and the public schools have been closed this fall and will be closed till the first of the year as well. Not all of these measures have been met with overwhelming public support though. Businesses are only allowed to have as many people in their shops as they can attend to and the Bonner Mill only began operations again a couple of weeks ago. But these aren't the most controversial of the new measures. Have you heard about the placards? No, can you tell us about them? Any homes that have cases of the flu in them are placed under quarantine by the police and the police enforce this quarantine. If you have a person with flu at home, you need to put out a placard announcing that so that people don't come in and spread the disease. The community has had to resort to some truly drastic measures. Do you have any family, Mr. Jones? 
My wife passed away about 10 years ago, and my boy is serving with the army in France. I was hoping after the armistice with Germany, he would be home for the holidays, but it looks like it will be a few more months still. I've been especially worried lately. Uh, did you hear about young Paul Dornblazer? Mm -mm. He was one of the first uh, to enlist out of Missoula in June 1917. He was a star athlete at the university, had a very promising young career as a, coming up as a lawyer and was killed during the last couple of months of the war. I just pray my boy makes it home safe. Are you celebrating the holidays? Not in the same way I did when my wife was alive and my boy was at home. We've all had to become a bit more practical with the war and the flu. I thought after I finished cleaning the church tonight, I might make some paper cups for the hospital. I'm not the best at it, but it's a way for me to give it back to those who are less fortunate this holiday season. Those who have a loved one suffering from the flu and only want their family members to return to health. Wait a second. I can only make one cup myself, but if the rest of you would help me, we can do even more to help the sick. Would you give me a hand making some paper cups? Sure, we'd be happy to. Making a paper cup. We're going to start with a square piece of paper and we're going to turn it into a triangle. And we're going to take the corner of our triangle and bring it up to the straight edge of the other side. And we're going to do the same thing on this side. We take our corner and bring it up to meet the other side. And then we'll turn the tops over, fold them down. And then when you open it up, you have your very own paper cup. Well, thank you so much for your help. I'll take these over to the hospital. I'd like to think that they might stop someone's son or daughter from getting the flu. And in this holiday season, I don't know what would be a better Christmas gift. Well, thank you again, and good evening to all you folks. The next building that we'll enter is the Grant Creek School. The Grant Creek School served the Grant Creek drainage from 1907 to 1937. As we enter, the year will be 1933. Missoula and the rest of the country is in the grips of the Great Depression. There is hope, though, as President Roosevelt has created a flurry of new programs to help. Well, we are travelers of a sort, and we saw your light on. Is it all right if we warm up for a few moments before we continue our journey? Yes, of course. Please come in. Guests are always welcome here. I'm Mrs. Emery. I'm the schoolmistress here at Grant Creek School. These are a couple of my students, Billy and Laura. We were just preparing the schoolhouse for our annual Christmas play. I'm very proud to say that this year the students have selected Mr. Dickens' A Christmas Carol. Now. Our decorations are going to be modest this year. After the crash of 29, things are so difficult for everyone. Some families can't even find food to eat. So things like Christmas trees, decorations, and gifts seem a luxury. But one thing we have plenty of is Goodwill. Have you heard about the toy hospitals? We haven't. What are toy hospitals? Well, a number of Montana communities have taken to hosting toy hospitals. With no money for new things, they collect broken and used toys, they repair them, and here at our local toy hospital, with the help of an organization called Future Farmers of America, they paint them for Christmas colors, and then they add those to the toys that are made throughout the year out of scrap wood. How do they deliver the toys for Christmas? Oh, well, they had nearly 60 names on the list last year. And so a group of volunteers, everyone took a, a name of people who live nearby. And on Christmas Day, they delivered the toys to the children in sleighs, complete with jingly sleigh bells, just like Santa Claus. Well, it may be difficult for everyone, but the true spirit of Christmas remains. Speaking of spirits of Christmas, I really ought to get back to my students and their play. But I wonder. Perhaps one of you could help the students with their lines? Sure, I'd be happy to. Wonderful. Laura and Billy, would you come over here, please? We're going to practice the play. Billy, if you would stand right here. 
And this lovely volunteer has offered to help you with your lines. Now, Laura is our narrator, and Billy is the ghost of Christmas past. And I'm going to have you play the part of Ebenezer Scrooge. Laura. Thank you so much for helping us with our lines. I really want to do well. All, my mom, Pa, and all my brothers and sisters are coming to watch me perform. Oh, it's so fun. Laura, you may begin. Ebenezer Scrooge lies in his bed. He worries about Marley's prophecy. As he awakes, the spirit, the clock strikes midnight, then quarter past, half past, three quarters past, then exactly one. Scrooge waits. The hour itself, and nothing. Bah humbug. Just then, a light flashes, and the curtains of Scrooge's bed are pulled aside. Are you the spirit whose coming was foretold to me? I am. Who and what are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past? No, your past. What business brings you here? Your welfare. Rise and walk with me, Ebenezer Scrooge. Scrooge accompanies the spirit and rises from his bed. They pass through the wall of his bedchamber and step onto an open country road. Why, good heavens, I know this place. Do you? How could I not? I was bred in this place. I was born here. You recollect the way, then? Why, I could walk it blindfolded. They traveled the road, passing many whom Scrooge knew. As they passed, Scrooge called them by name. Finally, they came to a schoolhouse in which alone people sat. The school is not quite deserted. A solitary child, neglected by his friends, is still left there. I was reading Ali Baba. It was his adventures with pirates, treasures, and a green parrot that provided me with my only joy that Christmas. That poor boy. What's the matter, Ebenezer? Is that a tear I see on your cheek? It's nothing. It's just that there was a boy on my doorstep last evening. I should have given him something, that's all. Let us see another Christmas. Very good, children. You're coming along so nicely with your minds. And I want to thank you for helping us this evening. And thank you for your kind hospitality, Mrs. Emery. We must be going now. We have other places yet to visit. Goodbye to you, and Merry Christmas. Bye. Merry Christmas. Our final scene today takes place in the Drummond Depot. This building was originally located in Drummond, 45 miles away from Missoula. It served the Drummond area until the Chicago, Milwaukee, St. Paul, and Pacific Railroad Company closed up shop in 1980. Uh, the Milwaukee Road Depot was moved to the museum in 1982. As we step inside, it will be Christmas Eve, 1957, and we will be speaking with the ticketing agent. Hello, welcome to the Drummond Depot. Are you here to catch a, a train? Because there isn't one to uh, quite a bit later tonight. Actually, we were out spreading a little holiday cheer and saw your light on. Perhaps you could use a little company? Oh, well, that's very kind of you. The Drummond Depot is uh, the world's biggest uh, bolt shippers. <laughs> well, uh, the boys down at the yard are going to have a good laugh on that one. <laughs> do you always work on Christmas Eve, Mr. Barrows? Sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. It all depends on my bosses. But this year... I really could use the extra money because I have a special gift plan for my favorite niece. Well, you know, she just moved uh, to Montana from Minnesota. And uh, her mother tells me things have really changed there. It's just not the same as it used to be when we were growing up. I have a lot of pleasant memories there, but things were really, you know, uh, tough with the Great Depression. And uh, a lot of working men really had a hard time with that. Okay, I remember those wonderful times I had growing up. Perhaps you could share some of your happy memories from Minnesota with us. Yeah, I think about those. You know, sometimes when I'm in the office here, uh, or maybe it's the take, uh, I hear the winds just sort of going through the office. With, it seems like they have memories on them. Or it's maybe it's something in the eggnog, but something brings me back to those days. Back in Minnesota, I was born in a small cabin in a rural area. They say Minnesota has 10,000 lakes. I swear I must have ice skated on at least half of them. But there was no ice skating on Christmas Eve, that's for sure. That was the, day, that was the time for preparation for the holiday. We began the day by sweeping and cleaning the cabin. My mother, who was a very proud woman, 
even though we didn't have much, always kept the cabin clean and spotless. Then after lunch, my father, who would get off of work early, would take us out in his cutter. In case you didn't know, a cutter is a one-horse sleigh, and we would go out to pick out our Christmas tree. When I was 10 years old, when my sister was born, my father let me chop down the tree, and I could just feel the pride as I looked at him, and I swung that big axe. What was it like in the cabin? It was very busy, as I remember. Now, being my, my mother had just had uh, my sister, my aunt, my cousins, and my sisters all helped to uh, get everything ready. Though my mother had an eagle eye as she watched her to make sure everything was perfect. When they prepared our Christmas feast, which was a pot of mixed bean stew on the fire, they also prepared sweets. My father and I would go in the corner where we had the tree and we would decorate the tree. And what we used was handmade ornaments made from berries, popcorn strung on a string, and candles. After dinner, us children exchanged our own gifts. And then father sent us to bed, but after we sang a couple of Christmas carols. What was Christmas morning like? Well, I suppose not everything changes. My cousin slept in the loft in the cabin, and we would all come, one of us would wake up early. And then little by little, all of us would wake up. And then we would go down the ladder, it's all excited. And my father would be there. He had had the fire stoked and a cup of hot coffee brewing. And he always had that sly smile on his face on Christmas morning. As the other adults woke up, we would get to open our presents. The girls would get dolls and tea sets. The boys, we would get drums and blocks. Sometimes each of us would get a book. But you know what the best gift was? And it was proof that Santa had come. Because we got oranges, and they would be in the toes of our stockings. And we knew that was proof there was a Santa, because where can you get oranges in midwinter in Minnesota? Thank you so much for sharing your wonderful story with us. But before we go, I had one last question. You mentioned that you're working to buy something special for your niece. Can you share with us what it is? Oh, it's my pleasure. But you've got to promise not to tell her. Of course. Well, I suppose I can then. I am getting my niece the new Lady Lionel train set. They come in pastel colors just for girls. They're a brand new model. They cost me about, they cost almost $50, but I am so hoping that she's going to love it. I'm sure she will, Mr. Burroughs. Thank you again for allowing us to warm up a bit and sharing your Christmas stories with us. Mr. Barrows certainly is a very kind man, and I hope that his niece enjoys her train. Unfortunately, if she does, she's one of the very few. The Lionel Company were taking a stab at the dark as their sales had already been decreasing, but in 1957 they did come out with the Lady Lionel train. But what they soon discovered was that most little girls who were interested in trains wanted one that would look like the real thing. This concludes our 2020 Lantern Tourist Program. If you enjoyed tonight's program, please consider making a donation to the Historical Museum at Fort Missoula's Friends Organization. The Friends of the Museum raise funds for education, preservation, and programs like the one you watched tonight. We want to wish each and every one of you a happy holiday season. We look forward to a time next year when we can gather again for this program. Finally, I want to thank MCAT for coming out to film the program and I want to thank each and every one of you for watching it.